Uh, a very warm welcome to Brunel University London. Uh, my name is Arad Reisberg. I'm the head of Brunel Law School. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's evening debate. Um, you all know this is a very serious topic and I'm grateful for you for taking the time to, um, for anything else that you might be doing to stop, think, reflect on this important matter. Um, this event is the inaugural event of our newly created Human Rights, I need to get the name right, Human Rights Society and Art Research Group by two of my colleagues who are sitting here in the front row. So it gives me a great pleasure uh, to open this. Um, I'm now going to invite my colleague Elena Grosby, co-director of this research group, and our main speaker for tonight, Professor Javi Drachman, the UN Reporter on uh, Iran, to join me on the stage. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Arad, for the introduction, and welcome everyone again. Uh, to the first talk show of the research group on human rights, society and arts. Uh, before we start, I want to uh, thank the, my colleague and the co-leader of the research group, Dr. Marcus de Matos, who was behind the organization of this event and make all this possible. So thank you, Marcus. And thank you, Javid, for um, joining us today and address such an important topic. So today, conversation, and we are going to uh, have this as a talk show. Uh, so it's not going to be a formal presentation, but a more an open discussion, and we really welcome your questions at the end of our first uh, 20 minutes of uh, questions from, from myself, but then we are going to open the floor and get questions from the, the, the audience. So uh, today's event is um, on a very important topic that has been on the forefront of news uh, uh, since September, unfortunately. That is the violence against women and girls. And the title of today is uh, Violence Against Women and Girls in Iran, an Unfolding Tragedy Since the Killing of Masa Amini. And it's not, uh, uh, it's not a case that we focus on that, because unfortunately on 16 September, when Masamini was killed, uh, triggered something in, in Iran, in Iran public society and public um, opinion, but also uh, make us all uh, aware of what's going on in Iran even more than before. Uh, so before we start and discuss more generally the situation of women and girls in Iran, Shavi, can you please help us understand who was Masamini and what happened to her? Thank you, Elena. Uh, before I start, uh, if I can just thank you and Marcus uh, and the law school and indeed Brunel University for organizing this very important event. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And I thank uh, all participants uh, this evening for their time and for their um, understanding of the very serious critical situation that, that exists in Iran. Um, secondly, I want to say very quickly, I pay tribute, I appreciate all of the Iranians who are fighting an authoritarian repressive regime in Iran and we must support them. So again, um, I wish them the very best. Now in terms of uh, Gina Masamini, she was um, a 22 year old Kurdish woman who was traveling from the Kurdistan region of Iran to Tehran um, with her family. And she was stopped by the, what we call it as the morality police. And the morality police, they have this task of stopping uh, young women or, uh, or women in general uh, and uh, ensuring or assessing whether they are properly wearing the hijab. And in her case, they stopped her and they felt that she was not wearing proper hijab. Um, as you would know, and if you don't know, I'll just explain that it is a criminal offense in Iran not to wear a proper hijab. There, there are penalties, uh, including imprisonment and fines. So this uh, young woman was pushed into a policeman and therefore and thereby she was taken into custody of the morality police. They took her to a detention center and where they claimed that uh, it was going to be a, a minor affair of re-educating her. 
But what we have uh, seen and the evidence and the testimonies that I have received is that she was beaten while she was in their custody and she died because of these uh, injuries. Um, of course, uh, the Iranian regime, uh, typical to their history and to their existence, uh, are denying and it's a cover-up scheme on their part and they're saying that there was no wrongdoing. But uh, Gina Massa died um, in police custody, in the custody of the state on the 16th of September. Uh, and the problem we have is that the Iranian authorities, as we know, they have not conducted any independent, any impartial or any objective investigation. They have simply taken their historic position that we didn't do anything wrong, uh, there was nothing wrong. It, this girl was facing pre-existing um, pre medical conditions and therefore she died. And they have denied all responsibility. And that is, in summary, what the situation was with Gina Massa. But unfortunately, we know that she was not the only one. And after her, older women suffered similar um, uh, situations. And more generally, uh, women and girls are experiencing uh, violence and discrimination in Iran, both due to the laws, like the one that you just mentioned, but also societal practices. Uh, can you please tell us more about that? Yeah, and if I can just, uh, starting from this issue of enforced hijab, um, this enforced hijab is, um, you know, it violates women's dignity and it violates their rights. And for years and for decades, women have been, you know, protesting against this policy of enforced hijab. And, and it, it's a violation of their rights because the state is imposing. It is not simply uh, a law which is not enforced. I mean, the morality police have a role to play and they were enforcing, they have been enforcing. They have been violating their dignity. And uh, the unfortunate, tragic thing is that since uh, President Ibrahim Raisi has come into power in 2021, he has taken on board, he has emphasized that it is so important for this Iranian uh, regime to enforce. Uh, he, he says that this is a, a moral agenda for him. Uh, there are new regulations that have come up. He, he signed on them. Uh, he has pressurized uh, women. There has been new technologies that are being introduced. So women, for example, when they're traveling on public transport, uh, they could be monitored. And if they are perceived as not wearing proper hijab, then they would be fined. Or, or worse still, uh, they could be barred from public transport. They could be barred from entering uh, public, uh, you know, public uh, galleries. Uh, they could be uh, stopped from entering banks. They could, uh, you know, government officials, women who work for the government, could be sacked from their jobs. So there are very serious consequences. And um, a lot of these uh, women who protest against uh, the enforced hijab, they are in fact not just charged with not, not wearing proper hijab. In many instances, they are charged with uh, national security or morality-based uh, offenses which carry very serious punishments, including, uh, for example, sometimes uh, to death. So this is a very serious uh, issue about enforced hijab. But as regards your broader question about uh, you, the violation of the rights of girls and women, there is a whole catalogue of issues. And in fact, if you look at my report of uh, January 2021, which I presented to the Human Rights Council, I noted that women and girls are second class citizens in Iran. And I will just identify a few um, areas where, where I have come to the conclusion why they are, in my view, second-class citizens. One is if you look at, for example, uh, the criminal, criminal law. Now, criminal responsibility for girls in Iran begins at the age of nine, a nine lunar calendar. What it means is that these young girls could actually be charged with offenses which carry the death penalty, like kisas, for example, killing, or hadood offenses. So at the age of nine, criminal responsibility begins for girls' uh, uh, lunar years, uh, whereas for, for boys, it starts at 15. Uh, and as I said, that they can have very serious consequences. They could be sentenced to very serious offenses. And we know that uh, some very young girls have been sentenced and executed 
over the, over the years. Then um, a related issue is about child marriages, you know. And, and you know child marriage, any child marriage is a forced marriage because the consent is not involved. Now the law in Iran is that um, a girl at the age of 13 can be married and even younger girls can be married with the consent of the father and the court. So uh, every year we see a, a rise in the number of very young girls being forced into that marriage. Then you also have a lot of issues uh, surrounding the criminal justice system. For example, there are exonerations um, by law, in criminal law, for example, uh, for fathers or grandfathers who kill their children. That is written in law. Yeah? There is also um, exonerations and exemptions for men who kill their wives uh, um, and their partners, the wife's partner, if they see them uh, in an in a adulterous uh, uh, action or, or suspected adulterous relationship. So the criminal justice system creates exemptions uh, and it, it allows, it encourages violence against women. And there are many other ways where violence against women is, is encouraged. Um, uh, there are also issues uh, in, in personal laws, in family law. For example, in, in family law, uh, women have a very subservient situation. Uh, for example, in marriage, in divorce, in custody, and in guardianship. So all of these areas, women are discriminated. If you look at other uh, areas of, uh, of Iranian law, and if you look at the, at the global situation, how, uh, how they are inter relatively in terms of the other countries. So in 2020, when I was doing my uh, report for the 2021, I noted that Iran is 183rd out of 193 countries in the global index. So it is very poor. If you look at the current political scenario or, or the people who are in charge in, in making laws or in developing policies, you would not find any woman. So for example, if you look at the position of the supreme leader, the president, the guardian council, the head of judiciary, the head of supreme court, women are not to be seen, you see. And uh, women are legislatively excluded from becoming judges in Iran, you see. Uh, so this is, uh, I mean, I think this is a very serious indictment for any state to recognize that women's situation is dire in that country. Absolutely. But then, I mean, all the picture that you just draw for us shows some structural discrimination and violence against women that absolutely date back not from the 16th of September, but well, well uh, before that. So why do you think now we, we are seeing all these protests and all these, uh, um, I mean, exacerbating of, of, of violence and, and also protests from, from both women and men in the streets of Tehran and in major uh, Iranian cities? Why now and why uh, after the death of Masamini? Yeah, no, yeah, that's a great question and thank you for asking that. And, and it's actually, uh, been uh, an important question which needs to be understood. Now, you see, uh, we've seen um, masses of protests uh, in recent years and historically, and, uh, and we have colleagues who've done uh, a lot of work, for example, on the November 2019 protests, where uh, even by a very conservative estimate, over 300 people were killed in a short space of a week. So that is a very serious in, 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 uh, incident. Um, but you're right that at that time in November 2019 or in, in previous protests, uh, we did not see that level of international you know, concern or, or a sustained uh, international concern. And, and hopefully we'll have, to, we'll have time to talk about what the international community has done. Uh, for example, we have set up an unprecedented uh, mechanism to investigate. So, so that has not happened. So your question is very legitimate. Why now? Um, there, are, there are various uh, elements to this question. One is that, you know, violence against women and the way this girl was, was brutalized, I think it touched upon all of the people of Iran. But this movement, uh, what they call it, uh, Women, Life, Freedom, uh, was triggered by young women and girls, by the younger generation. You see, they have all the aspirations which we have. So they could not accept that, you know, in 2022, uh, the state is still so repressive and it is so 
uh, you know, it's so hooked up on, on, on forcing women to wear a piece of cloth in the way they wanted to do. So it was a spontaneous movement led by young people. We haven't seen that. I mean, uh, November 2019 was a, was a very important movement, but these were economic issues. Like, for example, the, the fuel price uh, had been doubled. So people uh, were really frustrated, angry at the economic repression. But this one really touched upon all of the young people. But then the historic grievances have come at the forefront. Like, for example, uh, the ethnic and religious minorities have been suffering for a very long time. But this coincided because Gina Massa was a Kurdish girl. So the first protests started in the Kurdish regions, but it's quickly spread over. So it, is, uh, it has been a combination of factors, but now is the time that all of the people of Iran have stood up and they have said no to uh, uh, all sorts of oppressive activities by an authoritarian regime. Yeah, and indeed this, uh, I mean, this youth components give us some hope for the future in the sense of the new generation uh, standing up, but also gives a very uh, grim uh, figure of the fact that the average age of those who have been arrested is 15 years old. And indeed, as you said, like, the death of Masamini triggered lots of uh, protests, uh, but also lots of brutal repression mm. from state authorities. And some figures uh, updated to uh, the 3rd of January, uh, provided by uh, human rights organization, says that 19,200 uh, 19, people were detained, uh, 516 people were killed, uh, and uh, four young men were executed. And of course, so. From, from just a situation of uh, uh, human rights violation for women and girls, it became a more widespread uh, human rights violation affecting those who are protesting. So um, arbitrary killings, arbitrary arrest, as well as alleged inhuman and degraded treatment. Uh, so can you give us uh, a picture of, from what you know, uh, part of your mandate, what's the situation, what are the other human rights uh, uh, challenges and threats that uh, those who are protesting right now are facing in Iran? Yes, uh, I mean, you have, um, you have already mentioned the level uh, of extreme uh, repression. So people uh, arrested, detained in their thousands. So exact figures are never known in Iran because the regime uh, is, uh, is hiding those figures and, and they are shutting down, they're making every effort to, to uh, stop freedom of information. Um, for example, internet shutdown, etc. But uh, I mean, it, it, as we know that in such large numbers, mass arrests, detentions, torture in prisons, uh, killing of uh, people. I mean, you, you mentioned a figure of 458, but these are figures that you know, vary from civil society organizations. But what is true that a very large number of people have been uh, killed and a very large number of people have been uh, injured. And the, the tragedy of it all is that the Iranian regime is creating an environment of fear. They want to kill people uh, because they want uh, a repression to be the framework of how they operate. So, so the whole exercise, for example, when protest takes place, it is not to stop people protesting. It is to create an environment of fear so that people are afraid and not to come out. And that's why you would find, and certainly I have uh, received all these submissions and testimonies that Iranian security forces, which include the besieges and the, their uh, you know, intelligence and all uh, army including, they have been uh, shooting at people with live ammunition, with bird pallets, with, with tear gas, to kill them effectively. It's not to, to stop protests because we have a, a large international framework, you know, uh, there are basic principles, foundational principles, uh, which they could have uh, deployed, but that has not been the case. Again, a serious concern is, and I, I regret to say that, that they have been uh, shooting at women at very sensitive parts of their body to, to actually uh, damage them permanently. You see, it, it is so shocking. Um, they have been killing children. I mean, uh, the figures that we have is that at least 68 or 64 children have been killed by security forces. And if you 
if you investigate that further, if you want more evidence, you can have a look at the Child Rights Committee um, statements. For example, they not only condemned the killing of children, they said that they have information whereby parents are being forced to absolve the security forces uh, saying that uh, the, the children had committed suicide, for example. So it is a very uh, disturbing, harrowing picture which the world has seen. And, uh, and that's why, and that is the reason that all of the international community galvanized to establish this fact-finding mission to hold the perpetrators accountable. Because that is the ultimate justice for the people of Iran. And, I mean, focusing on, on your last point about what the UN is trying to do, and of course, I mean, like, you, you, again, you picture, uh, you draw a very uh, terrible picture of, of human rights abuses uh, going on right now. And of course, the UN, uh, for its mandate and mission, uh, is the, probably the most competent uh, institution to, to, to try to do something. And you mentioned the establishment of this fact-finding mission, but uh, is, is that been uh, effective? Or can it be effective? Or what else, what other tools the international community, and, inter and, and both in terms of the United Nations, but also maybe states, uh, what can they do uh, and what they are doing at the moment to uh, do something? No, that's, that's a great question, thank you. And actually it brings us to our, also, to our academic understanding of, uh, of uh, international human rights law and the limitations within the framework that we operate. So um, you know that the, the framework of the international human rights law is uh, established through the United Nations. And we have a general assembly and the subsidiary organ is the UN Human Rights Council, which, which is a body uh, focused and, and uh, given the task of, uh, of uh, establishing human rights. But the whole of the edifice of human rights is actually limited in terms of uh, enforceability. So there are very strong limitations into what human rights law can do. So uh, in the context of the um, Human Rights Council, you know, you have the Universal Periodic Review. Iran had its uh, periodic review in 2019, and now there's another one coming up in four and a half years. Uh, then the Human Rights Council uh, established my mandate, uh, which started in 2011, and it is a yearly mandate. So you can, you can see the sensitivity that every year I have to be there at the Human Rights Council to seek its extension, you see. And there are states which are, uh, which are opposed to my mandate. They are opposed to my existence. They are opposed to whatever I say. So it's a delicate balance within the, the human rights framework. Um, this year, because of the very dire situation, uh, the Human Rights Council has been uh, active. And I, I am grateful to them that they have, uh, they have worked with me. Uh, we have campaigned for the setting up of this uh, accountability mechanism. And it was overwhelmingly accepted by members of the Human Rights Council. Uh, the vote was uh, on 24th of November, and I think there were 25 countries which voted in favor, and uh, you, people can correct me, I think there were only uh, six, seven, or eight states opposing. So uh, setting up of this fact-finding mission is a, is a unique, positive um, uh, initiative. Um, uh, I was also invited by the Security Council to present my concerns, so I, uh, I appeared to the Security Council uh, late last year, and, and members of the Security Council listened to me, what I had to say. Likewise, I presented a report, which I normally do in the General Assembly, and annually there is, uh, there is a resolution passed uh, on Iran, uh, uh, which is led by Canada. So um, these are all the initiatives which the UN does in terms of its broader framework. Now the big question is, what, what can uh, concretely be done to change the situation? And the, the limitation is that the human rights law or the framework that we have does not or cannot authorize use of force or regime change. That is not within my mandate. That is not within the mandate of the Human Rights Council. It's not in the mandate of any agency save for the Security Council. But the Security Council, uh, of course, as you know, has five permanent members, and uh, the, the permanent members have their diametrically opposed view on, on various issues. I mean, Russia and China would have different views to the other states. 
So uh, in terms of use of force, that is not an option. Any change that would have to come would have to come from the people of Iran themselves. And uh, what we could do is, what I'm trying to do is a democratic reform in the country. And I hope that uh, in, in the days, weeks, months or years to come, uh, there would be a democratic reform. It is, it is challenging, but that is what human rights framework is. Uh, not much in terms of, uh, of a radical agenda that we can, we can put forward. Absolutely, and I think this is the, the critiques that we often hear about the uh, ineffectiveness of the UN machinery, but of course it creates this kind of like raising awareness about something and creating a institutional settings uh, within which we as a civil society we can operate. Uh, but we are hearing from, from what's going on in Iran that like, some changes are, are ongoing or, or they're just rumors about uh, small changes in the whether the morality police uh, uh, is still ongoing or not uh, or maybe abolished. I mean, do you think that something is already changing uh, or there are just uh, rumors and uh, is the, the, big, the change is still yet to come? Um, uh, again, an important question. Um, since uh, this uh, unfortunate killing took place, there have been statements made by individuals, and one was made in uh, early December by the Attorney General. He said that the morality police uh, is shut down by those who set it up. But that was a very ambiguous statement. Now what we have, uh, the information we have received uh, in December, late December, is that actually nothing has happened. Uh, and in fact, um, the important thing is that uh, the enforcement of hijab is still a policy of the state. They have not said that they will no longer enforce hijab or they, they will abolish or repeal the hijab laws or any of the laws which I mentioned to you uh, which violate the rights of women. So the, the, the regime is actually built on repression and its first target is women. So regrettably, uh, and I, I say with great sorrow and pain, that they are not going to change these laws unless they are pressured into it, unless the, the whole dramatic um, scenario changes, uh, because that, that is what they're built on, you see. And so going back to it, to, to us and like to, to what can be done to, to pressure uh, them to, to, to change. Uh, what we as civil society, both as academics, uh, but also uh, or civil society organizations, uh, what, what can we do? Is there anything we can do? Because of course, it's like, differently from what happened in, in previous years. This year, this time, the international community uh, seemed to be particularly concerned. So can we uh, capitalize on this interest and do something to meaningfully help uh, Iranians uh, in this fight? Yeah, I think that uh, we can do a lot. Uh, we have done quite a lot and, and, uh, and testimony to all that is the presence of this audience and, and thank you again to, to the research center for giving this subject, uh, it's uh, due uh, share of recognition. So that's, that's important. I think that um, an important element is our understanding of prioritizing human rights, the rights of all human beings, regardless of, uh, of their gender, regardless of their background, regardless of, um, of whatever considerations they may be. Because what we often find is that in the, in the competition between economic and political interest vis-a-vis -vis human rights, the international community gives priority to other considerations, not to human rights. And therefore, I think it's very important that we focus on human rights. But it's also important that we have objective standards of human rights. So when we talk about uh, women's rights, we talk about women's rights everywhere, you see. We don't forget that uh, Iran is one country with, uh, with an oppressive regime, but there are many others. So if we have to be genuine, there has to be a genuine commitment towards improving uh, the position of girls and women in all parts of the world. It cannot just be a, a political, you know, political initiative. The other key element, again, should come from within us, is the, is the oneness and the commonality of individuals. That women and men, they have the same rights and they have the same aspirations. 
we cannot hide behind religious relativism to say, okay, well, in Islam, that's okay. Or, well, in that culture, in that tradition, that's okay. I mean, there are certain essential rights which are the core of human dignity. And I, I mean, a great uh, document is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I, I hope that people will have time to, to read that. So we have to believe in that oneness, in the core value of the human dignity and not allow or hide behind this religious relativism, which I often come across. And in the case of Iran, they, have, they, they always say, oh, it's, Islamic uh, it's an Islamic regime. Is Islamic law that we follow? No, it isn't. I mean, there are 53 countries which, which are part of the OIC members. They are all Islamic. They say they, many of them follow Sharia. So um, they, don't, uh, you know, they don't execute child offenders, for example. They don't uh, torture. They don't uh, flog uh, people. They don't amputate hands and feet. Uh, they don't have um, executions, for example, on the basis of alcohol consumption written in their law. Or they don't have vague uh, offenses, like, for example, just last year, over 500 people were executed in Iran, you see. So this is not, this cannot be permitted just because the state says, oh, this uh, Islam says that. So that is my message. I think this is absolutely needed message, considering that lots of people will conflate Islamic law or Islamic is Islam informed law with all the human rights abuses that we're seeing in Iran. So it's absolutely important to, to distinguish the two things and not allow, uh, as you said, religious, uh, religious relativism claims to justify human rights threats. Thank you very much, Javid, uh, and um, for this yeah, very you. enlightening, uh, uh, I mean, discussion of, of the situation in Iran. And uh, I think uh, Aldoya will have so many more questions for you. I think it's the time to open the uh, floor um, to the audience. Um, and we'd like to, to uh, get your questions. I'm sure you all have plenty of questions. We'll take them uh, in pairs. Um, so, and there are microphones around the room. So I see someone there. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the presentation for the talk. Um, I have a question regarding the um, support of the international community. We have seen that there is a lot of support from human rights community, from civil society, from um, international um, decision makers, etc. But when you look at the in, within human rights, when you look closer in the human rights community, in academia, um, there are some scholars who are hesitant, some of them are silent, and they do not necessarily provide the same support or the same supportive message regarding to women in Iran. I've talked to some people, some of them have concerns about Islamophobia, they think that if they do, it may encourage Islamophobic um, views, especially sharing images of women burning babes, for example, that sort of imagery they are hesitant, they make it makes them hesitant. Um, there's also the idea of some ideological um, concern in terms of the, the anti-American, the anti-Western approach. Um, so what would you say to them? How should we convince them that they, are, they have got it wrong or they are not on the right side of this debate? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I take one. You're not going to like this. Um, I, so, so I'm, rich, I'm, I'm a lecturer here, I'm a lecturer in criminology, but I've also got a, a background in criminal justice and human rights. And it seems to me that Iran seems to be the, the watershed for the United Nations because your responses are so slow to what's actually going on and what is being uh, sort of put into the public domain by activists like Goldie Kamari, the uh, Canadian politician, the, 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 the criminal defense lawyer in America, you know, they're, they're so 
further ahead of what's going on and what you're sharing with us today. Um, I will, you know, I, I, I think when we're talking about violence against women, we need to be talking about the mass use of rape after, after arrest. We need to be talking about the mass use of rape against men as well. Um, we need to be talking about the explosion of the Evan prison. Um, and I think we need an explanation of why it's taking so long for the United Nations to actually respond. It took three months for you to get the Iranians off the Women's Council. So why are you so taking so long when really credible sources are, are, are talking about what's, what's going on? You know, like, you know, a couple of days ago, we got the assassination of one of the judges. Yeah. Why, why are you so behind in what's common knowledge? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, they're, they're great questions. I must say, um, not easy to answer. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I will try and respond in the best way that I can. So taking the last question first, I think that um, we have to look at the prism of international human rights law how states behave. States think differently. States have their own interest. So uh, the states which are, let's take the example of OIC, and I often confront them. I come from Pakistan. My own state is very uh, much opposed to my mandate, you see. Even, even my critical observations, they have been opposed to it. And they try to hide behind um, cultural relativism, religious uh, relativism, what um, Mo mentioned about the issue of Islamophobia, the issue about not understanding the Iranian uh, perspective, not understanding the state. And, and I must say that uh, there is a, a big following of that group as well, that if we talk about human rights, if we talk about the rights of girls and women, if we talk about um, uh, hijab, then we are following a certain political Western agenda. That is, that is the real challenge that we have to overcome. And what I'm saying, I, and I, I think I would try to respond to both of these questions, is that our essential framework should be international human rights law. On the subject of uh, hijab, I would say that women all over the world should have the right to decide what they want to wear and what not, what they, they don't want to wear. So uh, again, it's a broader issue. But when I engage with certain states, they say, okay, so what about France? And what about the European Court of Human Rights? What about uh, why women are not allowed to wear the niqab in, in certain countries? Well, how do you address that? And I would say, look, if I am looking and if I was investigating France, I would have the same position. And we must have the same position, that there is an international human rights framework which we must follow. And we, we must not deviate from it, uh, regardless of the state that we are engaged in. The other point about, uh, you know, clearly on the issue of Islamophobia, there are, there are, uh, there are countries and there are societies which, which again, which they, they would completely disagree with me from what I have said. They, they would say that I am driven by a Western agenda. And, and if you look at the, the criticism that I receive every six months, I mean, you, you would be shocked that it isn't just Iran. There are so many countries which malign me. They say that I am I'm on the payroll, I'm on the package of these countries. Uh, this mandate is, uh, in their minds, is tarnished because I, am, I, am, I have an agenda to insult and to humiliate the Iranians and the Iranian people. So it's, it's not an easy subject when you look at the global perspective. I know and we are aware of the mass violations of human rights. We, we know and tragically what you mentioned about the, the, the rape of girls and women. Um, but you have to look at the limitations of international law. I mean, you cannot use force. You, you just said, why has it taken three months? Believe me that it was a matter of day and night to, uh, to uh, encourage, but also to, um, to, to make sure that states agree on this investigative mechanism. It was not easy to set it up. 
And many states will confirm that there are many countries who made such a big effort to have this in investigative mechanism because it has never happened in the case of Iran. So there, is, there, are, there are positive elements and I hope that with this fact-finding mission, the fact-finding mission does accountability. It holds states to account. Uh, and I, I, would, I hope we have some more time because um, there are some other actions which has been taken, including, for example, sanctioning individuals in Iran and um, uh, some entities. But the point about uh, the Commission on the Status of Women, again, it was controversial. Um, I, I was on BBC uh, in December and I supported uh, the removal of uh, Iran from the Commission on the Status of Women. But there are many states and many societies which disagree with me. They say that uh, why, why should Iran be removed from the Commission on the Status of Women? But when there are other countries, when there are other countries who violate human rights and there are other countries who are not parties to the CEDAW. So that is, you know, it's, it's a complex political picture that we have. Yeah. And, and indeed on, on that, uh, on the removal of Iran from the Commission on Status of Women, more, uh, more than 20 countries either abstained or voted against, which showed how, I mean, divided is, is uh, was, I mean, is. It is very divided and uh, in fact even amongst, uh, you know, uh, 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 special rapporteurs, we have a number of special rapporteurs, uh, the opinion is not the same. I mean, I, I, I wanted Iran to be removed from the Commission on the Status of Women because I thought and I believe that even at a, 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 a principled position, even if it's not going to make a big impact to, the, to this regime, at least we should have uh, we should not have a country which violates women's rights in, in such a gross manner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question in my uh, You were talking about universality of human rights and cultural relativism. So when you look at from the cultural perspective, what you see is that there is a key theme that you can draw out, Hadood ordinance and laws, and then you know, uh, human atrocities, like from the country that I come from, they are blasphemic laws, and then women have been persecuted based on, you know, the misuse of those laws. So, do you think that there is any sort of ongoing debate about the legitimacy of enacting such laws? Because I, I, I do understand that, you know, the situation of Iran is dire, but then there are also democratic states wherein these laws still exist. So what do you have to say about that? Thank you. I think we have another. Hello everyone. Thank you for this meeting. And I'm from Iran. And you can imagine how much it's painful to see your people are killed every day. And uh, I want to say that um, as an Iranian, I'm trying to increase the awareness in the world, like using hashtag, using Instagram, but there is no result. And you cannot increase the awareness because you don't have the power. And I think because you have the power, do you have any practical uh, plans or any action to have a better result in, in Iran and stop killing people, stop uh, Killing the young, all of the people are killing are under 20 years age. So thank you for your response. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so um, to, to the first question, you see, um, uh, I am assuming, I, I, I think that we come from the same country, Pakistan. Uh, we, have, uh, we have laws and we've, we had laws which were very discriminating uh, against women. There are still laws which discriminate against women. We have the blasphemy law which carries a death penalty. But the point that I was making in a more subtle way earlier is that why is the international community not taking action against a law which is so draconian? I mean, we have, uh, I have worked on, on this for many years. We have uh, still a number of people who are on death row for blasphemy. And it's very easy to charge people for, for blasphemy because you don't have to establish the intent. And uh, there is uh, even indirect uh, evidence sufficient for conviction. Um, you would have come across the case of um, 
this lady, uh, Asya Bibi, who was on death row for, uh, for 10 years, and then she had to flee the country. There are many other uh, women and minorities who suffer from such laws. So we can't really call a country like Pakistan democratic. You see, if you, if you look at uh, the spirit of democracy, you see, I, I remember Ronald Dawkins, uh, the great philosopher, he mentioned that it, you cannot have democratic institutions where minorities are not part of the, of the lawmaking or of that democratic spirit. So really, there are many countries which can be targeted and must be targeted, and that's why I say that the frame of reference must be human rights law. We know very clearly that in human rights law, freedom of expression is allowed. Uh, death penalty is only uh, permissible for uh, very serious offenses, uh, but that does not happen in many countries, including Pakistan, but there are many others where death penalty is allowed, uh, and you have to look at the general comment of the Human Rights Committee to, to actually highlight the key concerns. So uh, I think that um, outside of Iran, there are also very many problems, uh, but we must have a, a core objective in terms of promoting human rights. Now, uh, the second um, question, again, is a, is a very important question as to what, what can be done to change all that. Uh, as I said to you, within international human rights law, there are very serious limitations. And countries like Russia and countries like China would oppose any form of intervention in Iran. The other problem is, and that's a practical problem, what would happen if, there, let's say, if there was a civil war in Iran? because that country would, uh, would uh, diffuse into various segments. So if you look at the situation in the Kurdish parts of Iran, if you look at the situation in the Balochis uh, regions, uh, a civil war would mean complete disruption and destruction. There is no coordinated political structures. They have not allowed in the last 43 years to, to have a political framework within which democracy can, can cherish. There are no civil society organizations left. There are, no, um, there are no trade unions left. There are no political bodies left. So it is not a very simplistic suggestion to say, OK, why doesn't uh, external inter intervention take place? So I think that's, that's not a very uh, practical or sensible solution, or it, it won't happen. I think what we need to do is to sanction individuals. I mean, uh, the European Union, the United States, UK, and many other countries are sanctioning individuals. They are sanctioning entities. I think there needs to be even more stronger action. Um, I think uh, there have been um, human rights uh, uh, sanctions. There have been other aspects, uh, cutting off trade relations, cu completely cutting off relations with Iran so that the Iranian regime is so isolated that they actually cannot function properly. I mean, one suggestion which has been sent to me is recalling ambassadors. I know it's, it doesn't, uh, it's not that radical, but it is, uh, it is a way forward to show that that regime is unacceptable. That regime is conducting apartheid, you see, and we must treat it in the same way as we, uh, as we treated South Africa or Namibia. In, the, in those apartheid times. So that is, that is the most uh, aggressive form of you know, human rights intervention that I can suggest. Many thanks, Javid, for the inspiring uh, presentation. I very much look forward to more events like this or here at uh, Zonel. I have a very short question. Um, uh, situations marked by, by severe human rights violation like the one in Iran today, have led to the elaboration of the doctrine of responsibility to protect, which in a nutshell implies that so state sovereignty is, implies shared responsibility for human rights. I was wondering whether this uh, has been debated within the United Nations, and if you think that this idea could provide some help for people in, in uh, Iran nowadays. Yeah. Thank you. No, of course, yeah. So, throwing um, yeah. <laughs> kind of question, um, but coming back to your talk about working, 
So there was a, there's an old discussion in jurisprudence about the rule of law, in which you have proposed, you know, those people who said that you can have a state with rule of law as long as you follow your own rules. And those who oppose that view said, if you produce results that are brutally unjust, you know, if you the brutal injustice, if your results are unjust, you should uh, you should not consider that the rule of law. And what troubles me when I see the Iranian legal framework, then you do have a legal framework. Can you say you have rule of law in Iran? Mm -hmm. Very very good questions, both of them. Thank you, Piero. Thank you, Marcos. I mean, these are, these are actually quite uh, interlinked to our academic understanding of situation as well. So on the question of responsibility to protect, I think that's, a, that's an important developing phenomenon. We have seen it implemented, but its implementation, in my understanding, has been patchy. It's not been comprehensive. Um, where states have seen their political interests or where they have been determined to take action, like for example in Libya or other instances, they have, uh, they have intervened. But the case of Iran is very complicated. I think that uh, responsibility to protect or any form of uh, intervention, albeit even humanitarian intervention, uh, is not, um, uh, it, it seems unlikely in the current context because we have to remember that Iran is a very powerful country. I mean, I, I have been told uh, on numerous occasions, look, we have, we have faced all sorts of aggression. We, since uh, 1979, we faced a war with Iraq, we faced um, sanctions, we have survived, we have faced other threats, um, but we have, we, have, uh, we have survived, so we will survive. So, uh, and, and that kind of mentality is actually also shared by Iran's allies. For example, the Russians, you know, they're very close to the, to the Iranians and there is a lot of uh, business going on in terms of the sale of drones and what support Iranians are providing. So it's, it is a, Iran is a powerful country in that regard. You know, militarily, uh, they are very oppressive, they are very insensitive, and they are, they are in the middle of a very delicate Middle Eastern situation. So I think for the international actors, it's not very straightforward, uh, the big powers, the, the big Western powers, to actually uh, consider applying humanitarian intervention or responsibility to protect, even though we recognize that the situation is so dire that uh, there is a, an international moral legal responsibility to protect those millions of people who are suffering and, and being persecuted. So that is, that is my understanding and, and you know, there's a close relationship between um, law and politics, so um, um, we, we will see how it unfolds. On the point of rule of law, I remember doing all of these um, seminars for our, you know, for, for our students who take public law. And this is quite a big intellectual uh, dive when we talk about or talk about the understanding of rule of law. Because countries have laws, as you rightly said, they have laws, but the question is, do they actually follow the rule of law? And what is our understanding of rule of law? And we, we come across many jurists, you know, as what you have just said, that the, the meaning of rule of law is not that the law is followed. The meaning of rule of law is what is the substance of law? And if the law is bent, it's, uh, it's, it violates notions of justice, then even if it's followed to the letter, rule of law principles are not applied. And I think uh, this would be so aptly the case in Iran that they have a firm legal framework, they have a constitution, they, they apply laws to the court to the extent that it's sometimes shocking. Like, I mean, the number of executions that I mentioned to you, the number of uh, people who are tortured, uh, the number of amputations, they look at, their judges are looking at the penal code and applying it. But the law is itself crooked. It is unjust. And therefore, there is no applicability of the rule of law in Iran. Uh, in the interest of time, I see lots of hands up. So shall we take three questions? Uh, yeah. So here. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm myself, I'm Iranian. And you said about calling ambassadors 
kind of stuff like that. He talked about drones being sold to Russia that they kill people in Ukraine. One thing that I find so hard to understand is all of this stuff happens and we're still talking about it. Why don't we do those actions now? Like what else needs to happen? Because people are dying every day in Iraq. And I find it so difficult because we're here, we're talking about it. That's all great. But it's not since Masa Amin died. It's been going on for 40 odd years. Like it's not, it hasn't happened last week or last month or last year. And you say like, for example, trade, like it should isolate Iran, but for example, our own government in the UK, in the second quarter, we did £650 million pounds worth of trade. That's almost double compared to the year before, that same quarter. So I find it hard to understand. I do feel like sometimes the Western countries don't want to free Iran because they'll rather have, they'll rather have that region, like you said, in a mess, because it, 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 um, it benefits them. You have elections in America saying we need to do this to Iran, that to Iran. And I, I just don't understand, like, what else needs to be done? Do, do Iran need to invade another country for us to have those drastic measures? I just don't understand. Thank you. Yeah, one of my questions is rather the other end of the spectrum. It's about, does Iran listen to anybody? Um, basically, you know, the United Nations is trying to pressurise change um, in the way that you described. And I certainly don't envy you your role in uh, trying to get the United Nations to move together uh, on something that is so divisive. But as you indicated, the big problem is that many people will see it as a Western agenda and others will see it as an anti-Islamic agenda. Are there any Islamic countries that have influence over Iran that could work on them behind the scenes to get them to start thinking about change? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Soren Khedri. I'm a court from that part of Kurdistan, Iran. Uh, former political prisoner and victim of torture. First, I have to say that uh, uh, Mr. Javid, since the 21st of September, 83 Baluchis have been executed, and no one have mentioned them. The international media, the, I don't know, UN institutions, NGOs, they all talk about the four people who were executed recently, but 83 Baluchis have been executed separately, and no one has talked about them. My question is, <laughs> Don't you think the terms which are using and which are part of the international convention are part of the problem because they don't represent the national identity of the Iranian nations, for example, such as a people? When you say the Iranian people, what do you mean exactly by the Iranian people? Does the Baluchi, they consider themselves as the Iranian people, Kurds, Arabs, Azeris? That's the first question. Don't you think that the means which have been forwarded by international liberal order are also part of the problems such as the economic development and international human rights. Because when I look at these two means, available means, legitimate available means in international arena, I see that if I use them, I really assimilate myself into the, into the Iranian nation. So what will, what will remain uh, out of me if I follow those, uh, those advices. So, what is the alternative? Because as far as you use these concepts, or international organizations, they use these concepts, there will not be a united opposition to the Iranian regime. There must be a middle solution to, to the concepts which have been accepted by, 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 by the international system and the demands of the Iranian nations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take uh, your uh, question first. Um, uh, well, uh, if you look at my statements uh, in the General Assembly and in the Security Council and the fact-finding mission, uh, the resolution, you'll find the Balochis uh, mentioned uh, and mentioned quite prominently because uh, the incident that you're mentioning, uh, 30th of September, is actually uh, the human rights organizations say that um, at least 90 people were killed. So, and that, this was the largest number of killings that have taken place, you know, out of the 458 that we're talking about. 
Balochis have historically been repressed and oppressed and Balochis, you're right, they do not want to be part of the Iranian framework. They, want, they have their independent existence, they are, they are Sunnis, they, they, they differentiate from the Shia regime. Now the question and the problem that we have is what would we do with Balochis or the Kurds if this whole system um, you know, unfolds and there is a civil war because Balochis are in Pakistan as well. I mean, I come from there and they're equally repressed there. I mean, thousands have disappeared, you might know. They are also in Afghanistan. Now, all of these countries, they do not want to break up. So they are letting the system persist, even though it is a denial of the rights of the Balochis. The same with the Kurds. I mean, Kurds are in five countries. They are in Syria, they are in Iran, Iraq, Turkey. So what would happen if, uh, if Ir Iran breaks down? You see, uh, there are Kurds in Iraq. So the, the way the international framework operates is to keep the state structures intact. And there have been changes in the sense that they want to democratize and to allow minority rights within the existing framework. So to aspire for a Baloch territory, I think that in the current international framework uh, appears, you know, uh, not practical, that I would say. Uh, as regards the question about uh, does Iran listen to anybody, that's a great question actually. The reason is that um, sometimes in my mandate, I've, I have been so desperate to find out people or organizations. For example, I hear that uh, a child offender is going to be executed tomorrow morning. And the Iranians are so uh, devious. They set up times like, for example, on a weekend, you see, uh, a weekend morning, 6 a.m., when all the embassies are shut, you, you don't have any means. So you are in a desperate state, who to approach? And I think that if you have a good network of people, which I've tried to build in the last five years, uh, to have uh, very good, reliable contacts, who can reach out? So for example, uh, ambassadors, the High Commissioner, the UN Secretary General, I think the Iranians do listen to them. They, they, they cannot ignore them. And I've seen from my own experience that they have, for example, uh, we, have, uh, we have child offenders not executed, there has been delay, we have had human rights defenders released because uh, the Secretary General or the High Commissioner or some of the ambassadors have, you know, gotten to the Iranians directly and said, look, you know, we will, we will cut off relationships if you did that. So there is, there is that leverage. But uh, that said, uh, there are, you know, there are things that Iranians are still doing, like, for example, the, the, the repression. Uh, the answer to that is that we have to have a very concerted, very determined, united international effort to stop uh, these mass violations of human rights. Okay? And I think there was uh, one more on the, on the question about international community and uh, their political and economic interests. You are absolutely right that the way international law works, the way states work, they, it's a balancing exercise that what is in their interest? Are economic interests or political interests more uh, suitable to them rather than um, the human rights concerns? And that is why I say that we must prioritize human rights. If, if it's a business deal, if it's, if it's the JCPO, the nuclear deal, if it's a developing interests with Iran, let's look at the human rights situation in Iran. And I think the responsibility is on each of us to actually reach out to our nations and to say, look, this is a democratic country. The United Kingdom is a democratic country. You, you, I can reach to my um, member of parliament and to say, look, don't support a deal which violates human rights in Iran or anywhere else. And that must be our priority. Thank you. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, do we need to close or can we, can we continue? So I'm going to maybe the last round, uh, C3. Okay, I have to see many hands. Uh, let's take a three, three questions and then see maybe we do two rounds. Hi, so I have um, a more general question and comment. Um, so thinking about um, what has happened to um, 
women's rights, equality movements between women and uh, women and men, and more generically on human rights worldwide. Has there been um, a, a regression or a deceleration uh, that is more uh, wide than um, the, the dire situation in Iran? And can some of the um, uh, atrocities that we're seeing in Iran and also the response or the slow involvement of the international community be read um, and um, understood in that context as well. I, you, uh, several people have touched upon the idea of what can be done um, and I think your answers have almost exclusively been about what the UN can do and what states can do. I'd be interested to know about what individuals and people and the people in this room can do. And um, on that, you, you made a comparison with South African apartheid. And um, I'm too young to remember that, but I know from what my parents have said that, at least in the UK and possibly in other places, there were uh, boycotts on products like lemons and things like that. And if if, um, if the states are moving too slowly to impose sanctions on trade, is it plausible that people could impose sanctions on trade through boycott or their more effective means of um, activism? Absolutely. We take a third question uh, somewhere. <laughs> well, <laughs> just. I, actually, I don't have any question. I just want to say that um, okay, I'm from Iran and I come from Iran. And we have the anger and we have the tension. Well, sorry, I can't see it in you. <laughs> the anger and the tension, and you're alone. I mean, that uh, I don't know what you am gonna do. This is the closest distance I ever have with the UN. I, I saw a post in LinkedIn actually supporting women, which is we don't have internet in Iran. Nobody can see UN posts and UN support in Iran. Um, the government does not support us, the government here does not support us. We can't go back to our country because it's, if you go back and you can't come back, nobody will support you, nobody will be responsible for you. And I'm going to say that um, you said that people in Iran have to change at in the bottom of the line. People in Iran have to try to change. And you said that you are against a lot of country when you are trying to do some reports for us. but. Um, you know, we need some more serious action. We need to see it in you as a reporter, as someone who is reporting it to you. And I can see people in you and here, they are all emotional, they are all really so angry. And I'm going to say that, I don't have any question, I'm just going to say that we are all together, we can do it. And even people in Kurdistan and Belush, we are all brothers and sisters. There, is, there will be no civil war in Iran. There will be no separation. We are all Iranian, and we are all beside each other in this fight. And I know that we can make it. This impossible thing we can make it through, and we will have the victory. Thank you. Um, yes, I think that was a great comment. Uh, I think that's something that we, we have to, uh, you know, we have to embrace this, this spirit. And that's why I said that uh, we pay tribute to the Iranian uh, people who are fighting an oppressive regime. Uh, you're right that uh, repression is to an extent that, uh, you know, there's no freedom of information. Internet has been cut off. People cannot speak to their families from abroad. People are terrified. So uh, the Iranian people are very brave people. Uh, what I'm saying is that currently within my mandate or within the mandate of uh, the UN human rights mechanism, there is no enforcement policy. So there's no intervention that is permissible. And that I, I, I say and I agree that, that this is a limitation of international law. How can you change an oppressive regime? This is a dilemma which international law is facing. And states are not willing to actually go to an extent to use force. So that, that is a comment. Um, so th I think there was some other question. About, one question was about regression, right? Uh, there's somebody who asked this question, whether international human rights law is uh, regressing. I, I, I really wouldn't agree with that. I think that we are moving forward. The pace is variable. Uh, you can question it. 
But we have seen reform. So for example, since 1945, uh, you know, um, it's only a century ago that women did not have even the most fundamental rights and even in the most uh, progressive countries, which we now see. So for example, in this country, you can correct me, it was only in 1918 that women had the right to vote. So uh, there has been a movement towards recognizing the rights of women. We have uh, in 1945, it was the first time that the United Nations Charter spoke about equality between men and women. Previously, there wasn't any of that. We had the CEDAW Convention, we mentioned the Commission on the Status of Women, which was established in 1946 alongside the Human Rights Commission. Uh, now we have, um, I think, over 100 countries which are parties to the optional protocol to the CEDAW, which allows individuals to make submission of violations of their rights. So there is a progression. But that is not to deny that women's rights are you know, violated at the global level at a very large scale. But I think that we need more recognition of uh, their rights. I think we need to educate ourselves that men and women are equal in every sphere of our life, in public life and in private life. And also we have to take this education at a global level. So just to give you one example, that I come from Pakistan and we, we say that women are equal, but they aren't. We, we deliberately re, uh, retain them uneducated. I mean, we only spend about 2% of our GDP on education. And all of that is hidden in the context of, uh, of religion. We undermine women's rights. So I think we have to, we need to change and we need to be more progressive. Um, and there was one further question, was that about uh, apartheid? Backwards, yeah. I think that, uh, that is a very uh, interesting, important suggestion that individuals can take. And I think what should happen is that uh, we should work together towards more awareness of the situation, the dire situation that exists in Iran, but in some other countries as well. Let's, let's not forget that Iran although it's a, it's a very serious culprit, but there are many countries where women's rights or other forms of gender apartheid is taking place. Um, I think we should mention um, Afghanistan now, the Taliban oppressive regime. We cannot allow them to so humiliate women, you know, not even to, for them to get any form of education. So there should be an obligation on us to oppose any form of deals with countries like Iran or Afghanistan we should boycott with them completely and we should pressure our members of parliament, we should pressure our government not to uh, do some back deals, not to engage with them in any kind of business, even though it may be lucrative. And can I say that there are many other countries in the world, and I do not want to name names, uh, we have seen important events taking place in those countries where women's rights and rights of sexual minorities are being violated and we must take a stand against those. Shall we take the final round of questions? Uh, I think, just not to protect. Yeah, we have two questions there and one there. Yeah, yeah. No, please, please, yeah. yeah. It's absolutely fine. Um, if I can say, yeah, no, please, if you want. One thing that uh, I realized in the back of your mind is this worry of your mom breaking apart. Iran is a 4,000 year old country. Your power, the power that you interpreted as soft power, you don't have military power. The soft power goes from China all the way to Mediterranean. I don't know, I, I'm uh, originally from half of me is Gilad, half is, is uh, Azari. But I don't know what I call myself Iranian or I call myself Kurd because some of the greatest uh, kings of Iran were from Kurdistan. So Kurds are Iranian, Iranians are Kurds. To me, they're not different. That this fear of Iran breaking apart is not uh, anything that I can, any of us share because we had a 1979 fundamental revolution. Our country was literally obliterated in, in all its layers of, of, of governance. And this country didn't break apart at that time. We went through a 10-year-old war with Iraq. And every Kurd, every Azeri, every Baluch defended Iran's borders. Anything that has been taken from Iran has been taken.
taken by force, obviously from Russia. So we don't consider Russia as our friend. In general, what I'm trying to say is that the world community is scaring that Iran is going to fall apart. If it, if it comes out, it will come out. It has gone through many of these sorts of turbulence, and I'm hoping. It's just that, uh, Javid, please, in your, in your, you know who, who you see is very important. But back end, we're, it's not Syria. It's not these countries that were broken down from ex-empire. So Iran is not going to Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, yeah, if, quick questions, if we, you can, uh, just to... Oh, so oh, So you spoke of trade sanctions, <coughs> yet we don't have an exception within World Trade Organization law. We have exception when it comes to climatic change or in you know public health, but yet there is no exception which relates to human rights specifically. So would you suggest maybe a reform to World Trade Organization law or the mandate so that we can ensure um, human rights? Uh, I don't know uh, if it's telegraphic yeah. question, like very, very, very short, we can take both of them. Yeah. Uh, my question is basically about the United Nations itself. Uh, the emergence of the United Nations itself came into place as a result of the failure of the League of Nations that failed to protect minorities. Now, you have talked about the fact that if the limitation of the UN and the role that Russia could play, Russia, China, they could play to frustrate any action that would be taken. Now, my, my question is not you see that a review of the United Nations structure itself is actually where we should start from. That is my question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very quick question over. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Sorry, my question is uh, similar to what he asked. We have seen United Nations in the past that United Nations have refused the norms in state practice, into state practices through national, national election plans. Like we say that there is limitation of international law, but then we talk about national election plans and how those international frameworks have been embedded into the member states. Does it does have the impact on the states as well? But we see that we can move beyond these limitations, just like the United Nations have done it in the past. My question is, is there an alternative way or, uh, for Iran to, after the, to have a dialogue with the international community or to have a framework in place? Rather than reforms, they can have a framework in place that can speak uh, about how to protect women and specifically for all Muslim countries because, and to make women subject of uh, international law and for their protection to not um, to if it's two seconds, you, you, we can give the floor to, yeah, to the more final question, and then yeah, we, we can, yeah. to some final yeah. uh, answer all together, yeah. Javid, if you can. So we want to give everyone the... Thank you so much. Um, I want to mention that I understand your point on the importance of human rights on every country, and also I understand your point on all the limitations that is there. But when COVID hit, we then said that I have to go and fix the problem with influenza because that's there as well. There was some emergency that arise, that, and I think that if the women rights in Iran win, it bring hopes to the women all over the country, and even right now, people in the region, in Afghanistan, are rising up saying that why even Iran can do what we can do as well. So the support from Iran is somehow supporting the women all over, all over the world because they see the courage of them and it will inspire them. My question is that what could have been done till today that is not done by UN from your point of view? Right. <laughs> <laughs> This very difficult question, yeah. can you please give us some? I will, I will just, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a difficult question, but it is also a, a question which, uh, you know, raises a lot of emotions, but it, it cannot be answered in, 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 the, in the practical sense. I would say that, you know, taking an idealistic view, we would have loved for the United Nations and for nation states 
to be all democratic, to be all peace loving, to respect um, men, women and children in the same way, uh, to be equal, to, to, to be, uh, you know, to, to have the same proportion of wealth, investing resources, human values and human dignity. But that is not the case, unfortunately. Uh, international law does not work in, that, in the same way. Um, states operate on the basis of their own interests. And the and UN is made up of states, you see, and that's, that is where the main limitation is. Um, as regards, I think it, it relates to the other questions as well, the UN structure. Now, I think there has been progression. Um, some key elements are more transparent, such as the establishment of the Human Rights Council, the Universal Periodic Review, which is universal. Uh, you can investigate every country, you, you question them, uh, but then it's up to the state how they want to implement those measures. And therefore, I think that this is where the limitations are. And, and finally, I would just say on the issue of breakup, it isn't just, um, it isn't just uh, concerns of individuals or, uh, or groups. The concerns are actually coming from the states themselves. So if you look at the position of the Kurds, as I just mentioned, the Kurds are in Turkey and how Turkey treats the Kurds. This is also very worrying that Turkey, an important state uh, at the brink of Europe, is brutalizing the Kurdish people. And nobody is actually condemning uh, Turkey. Similarly, uh, Kurds are being repressed in Iraq, they are being repressed in Iran, uh, in Syria, in Yemen. So all of this actually creates a problem. Uh, take the case of the Balochis, as I mentioned. I mean, my own state is most repressive of the Balochis. They don't want Baloch Balochis to rise up for their rights. And they would be worried, and they are worried in my conversations with them. They are worried that if the Balochis of Iran stood up, it might jeopardize their very repressive authoritarian mechanism in how they control uh, Balochistan of Pakistan. Because you, you remember that Balochistan is a very... Um, prosperous region. It has mineral resources, it has a lot to offer. I mean, in, in a country like Pakistan, we rely almost exclusively or quite significantly on the gas. And yet the, the, yet the Balochis are deprived of any of the revenues, as we did in the past with the Bengalis, you know, prior to 1971. So it, it is a lot of states which are worried, and they are not letting the international mechanisms to actually help these minorities, you know, progress. Thank you very much, Shavit. And uh, of course, we could have stayed here uh, so much longer in uh, getting more questions and trying to understand better all the uh, uh, situation in Iran. But more generally, we, we touch upon so many issues related to human rights, universality, relativism, women's rights around the world. But of course, today we're focusing on Iran. And I really want to thank again all the Iranian people here in the room today who share with us your, your, your experience. Uh, we're really with you. And we will do, I mean, as, the, as a research group, but I guess as, the, as Brunel University, we are here to stand with you. And we'll, we'll try to do our best to continue to raise awareness and give you a forum for, uh, for keeping this fight on. So thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. And uh, thank you, Javi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.